In this video lesson, I'm going to walk you through the process of predicting products in a double replacement reaction. So some of this is going to be very similar to what we've been doing with single replacement. We're going to see some subtle uh, changes in terms of what we do with the product prediction. So in a double replacement reaction, the one key characteristic is that we now have two compounds that we're working with versus a single compound and a single element. And so we kind of have a few things to toss in in terms of charges and what's combining with what. Way back at the beginning of the year, we talked about the indicators that a chemical change is taking place. You saw some of those indicators in your lab that you did with the single replacement where you saw changes in your metal color, you saw bubbling happening, um, maybe some of you picked them up and felt the heat that was given off by some of them underneath. But the one thing that we didn't see a lot of was what's called a precipitate. We've seen precipitates, again, it's just something that's been a little while. A precipitate, again, is a solid that is formed when two liquids combine together. So double replacement reactions can kind of do a couple of things for an actual change to be taking place. That includes making that precipitate, producing water, and sometimes a gas can be formed. These are the steps to walk through how to do double replacement, and I'm gonna walk you through these five steps in this very first example. So the first thing you see is we're taking PbNO32 and combining it with Ki. So the first step in order to come up with your products is we need to know the charges of these ions. When you dissolve these into water, they break apart into their ionic forms and they're floating around with their charges. And so we need to know what those are. So I know that the first charge in a compound is always my positive and that my second part, and in this case we have a polyatomic, is my anion, my negative charge. If you look at your periodic table, and if you want to take a second and pause this, there's a few things that you need to work through this. Find your polyatomic list, find your periodic table that has charges on it, and then go ahead and find your activity series. We're going to be using the back side of the activity series in what's called a solubility table here momentarily. So what we need to do is use our resources to understand the charges of each of these parts. So nitrate, when you look at your list, Nitrate's a minus one. Lead, we do not know the charge because of its placement on the periodic table, but because of that subscript, that two that's outside of those parentheses, I know that has to be there because of the lead. I now need to break apart my other reactant, and that's the potassium iodide. I can use my periodic table to establish charges for each. Potassium's a plus one, iodine minus one. So we kind of did the similar thing again with single replacement. The only difference is we again have two compounds. So the next thing it tells us to do is switch partners. Like single replacement, like charges exchange. So my positive is gonna switch with my positive. My lead will switch with my potassium. So what I'm gonna do is rewrite the formulas or start combining what's going to combine together on the product side. So lead that was with nitrate on the reactant side is now going to combine with iodine on the product side. My other reactant or my um, potassium which is a reactant is going to end up on the product side. That's going to go first because it's the positive charge. Remember those formatting skills that we obtained back in our naming unit, that the cation is always listed first, anion is always listed second. So potassium is my cation, it is now gonna combine with my NO3, which is a minus one charge. I now need to get the formulas for my new compounds, and so that's done by crossing charges. So when I cross that, I'm gonna get Pb, I, two, and here, plus one, minus one, I get KNO3. Now I can start combining this into an actual reaction. So when I list things out, and I'm gonna start over here on the left to have a little bit of room, is I started with this PB NO32. And I'm gonna include that this is aqueous, and I'm gonna explain that here in just a moment. Reacting with this KI, 
which is aqueous. We've worked with aqueous things, so we can include states of matter in our chemical reactions. And aqueous just means that you've taken a solid and dissolved it into water, and it's broken apart into these ions. So all of those solutions we use in labs are all working with things that are aqueous. So I have my two products that I predicted, the PBI2 and my KNO3. Now, we need to figure out the states of matter of these two products. Like I mentioned, a lot of times double replacement reactions produce a precipitate. So if you want to go ahead and take a look, so my writing I think is going to have to disappear here for a moment, is that if I go to this slide here, this table is on the back side of your activity series. This is a solubility table. And so what this will do is it will help us decide if our two products are going to be a soluble or precipitate um, format. So when you go ahead and look at what we have, we have this PBI2 and this KNO3. So the PBI2, you would go to your solubility table. Across the top are your cations. Across the left-hand side are your anions. You're going to find where lead and iodine intersect. When you look at that part, you're going to find that you will see a X there. The reason why there is an X is that indicates that that means a precipitate will form. A precipitate is a solid that's produced, and so what we're going to do is add a subscript that is a set of parentheses with an S inside. That tells us that that's what that precipitate is chemically formulated of. We can do the same thing with the KNO3. So if we take a look, we have K, you go across the top of your table, find NO3 across the left-hand side, find where those two intersect. When you find where those two intersect, you're going to see an S. That S does not stand for soluble. That S stands for or solid. It stands for soluble. So that S, meaning soluble, means that it will dissolve. So what we indicate that as is aqueous. It's not going to have anything to do with the form, formulation of that precipitate. And so then again, it's going to be leftover ions in that solution. So now I have a balanced or unbalanced, but a chemical equation that shows the products. When I go to balance it, I have two NO3s on the left side. I only have one on the product side, so a coefficient of two is gonna fix that. That means I need to put a two in front of the Ki to balance the potassium, which fixes the iodine with the product side. So I can go ahead and put ones in here. And I have just successfully completed my first balanced double replacement equation. With the remaining examples, my recommendation is to get a piece of paper out that's separate from your notes and assignment. That gives you just a space to do the parts of breaking down your reactants and redoing your subscripts by recrossing charges. It kind of just keeps some of that excess steps that you have to work through away from your final answer so you aren't mixing things together. So what I would do is go ahead and get a separate piece of paper out and the first thing we're gonna do, like the example above, is that we're gonna break our compounds apart that are our two reactants. So I have this AgNO3. So the first thing I'm gonna do is break it apart into Ag and NO3. I know Ag is the cation, NO3 is the anion. Using my polyatomic table, I know NO3 is a minus one. Silver, I can establish charge based on the periodic table, but based on subscripts and everything, I can tell that it's a plus one because there is no parenthesis around the NO3 and that NO3 is a minus one charge. I'm gonna do the same thing with my other reaction, uh, reactant, which is the NaCl. So break it apart. My periodic table is gonna help me out with this. Sodium is a plus one charge. Chlorine is a minus one. Again, like charges are what's gonna swap. So silver and sodium are what's gonna exchange places. That allows me to then formulate my two new products. Like single replacement, order does not matter. 
So it doesn't matter which compound I put first, as long as I have both correct compounds. Again, I have no preference for the order they're listed in. I'm just gonna start with silver. Silver is my first cation. It goes first in the formula. So therefore, it's gonna combine with chlorine. I can then work on my other product, which is gonna contain what's left, which is sodium and nitrate. Sodium must go first, because sodium is the cation. The thing that works out nice with these is they're both plus one, minus one. So when I cross charges, I get AgCl and NaNO3 when I cross charges, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and put these into the blanks. So again, if you're working this, this I would all put on a separate piece of paper what I just boxed in. The final answer is what I'll take care of on the note page. So we're gonna have AgCl. I'm gonna go ahead and put a set of parentheses there so I can establish if this is my precipitate or not. And then my NaNO3. <clears throat> so now I'm at the point of, I can then work on figuring out what's my precipitate. So I've changed my screen. So again, across the top here, if you take a look, we're looking for silver. It's in the third to last column. I'm gonna find where that intersects with chloride. And when I look in that spot, I see that there is an X. That X means that it formed a precipitate. That is my solid. My other product is the, let me look, sodium nitrate. So if we go back, sodium is the second to last column. I find nitrate where they intersect, there is an S. Again, that S does not mean solid that S means soluble, that it's able to dissolve. So that is gonna be my aqueous. So I'm gonna put an S here for solid because there was an X in where those intersect. I'm gonna put an AQ here because that is where it had an S for soluble. I take a look balancing wise, everything's equal. So I now have a balanced chemical reaction and I've successfully predicted the products again of another double replacement. If I go back to example two, start with the same process. Start by breaking down your reactants into their appropriate ions. So I have PB and NO3. I've used NO3 now a couple times, and if you look at your list, you'll establish it's a minus one charge. Notice that we have this two on the outside of the parentheses. That is there because of lead's charge, so that means lead is a plus two. The next one is a little tricky tricky. We have CuSO4. When I look up SO4 on my list, I establish that it's a minus two. Notice that in the formula, there's not extra parentheses, there's not extra subscripts. So what made that negative two disappear? Well, copper has to be a plus two. So I have again broken my reactants apart into their charges to then help me figure out what's gonna exchange to then figure out what's the new formula of my products. So my like charges, lead and copper are gonna swap. So now I'm gonna have PB with a plus two combining with SO4 minus two. In my other formula, and again, which one I put first doesn't matter, my other product is gonna contain the copper. However, the order of the two ions matters in that the cation goes first, the anion nitrate goes second. Now we're at the step of recrossing our charges. So when I cross these down, notice charges cross and cancel. So we get PB, SO4. In the other example, we get copper with a one, and we get NO3 with a two on the outside. I have my two products, so I'm gonna go ahead and transfer these into the spaces up above. So I have PB, SO4, with a copper nitrate. Balancing wise, it's all good. 
So the last thing I need to do is just identify my two states of matter of my two products using my solubility table. So we're going to find lead across the top, sulfate across the left, find where they intersect. Where they intersect, there is an X. That means that is my solid precipitate. Where my copper nitrate intersects, I'm going to find an S for soluble. This is going to be my aqueous. We just worked one last example in class, and that's number four. So starting out, I'm going to break things down. So I have hydrogen plus one. Chlorine is a minus one. Lithium is a plus one. Hydroxide is a minus one. Again, my periodic table, polyatomic list, is going to establish that. I'm going to work on swapping like charges. So hydrogen is going to combine with the OH. Lithium is going to combine with the chlorine. Like we've done now in the last two examples, is we're going to work on crossing charges. So I get HOH for my first product, Li, Cl for my second product. You'll probably notice there's something kind of interesting about this first product, the HOH. Is there a way that we can rewrite this formula, or does it look like something we're more familiar with? Maybe you notice that that's probably H2O. So this reaction is interesting in that it doesn't produce a precipitate, but it produces something in the liquid state, and that's water. So when I put my H2O up here, you're not going to find that on your solubility table because it's water. So what we're going to do here is for our state is that it's going to make liquid water. So we're going to put an L in those parentheses. The other product is lithium chloride. When we use our solubility table, we're going to discover that it's aqueous, that it's dissolved. So this reaction did happen. It just didn't produce a precipitate. It produced liquid water. So again, this lesson was a walkthrough on how to predict the products of a double replacement to then use solubility table to determine what is the state of matter of our precipitate, or excuse me, not necessarily the state of matter, but what is the precipitate made out of in the reaction.